So welcome back to our second lecture concerning time-dependent properties of equilibrium systems and working towards the theory of time-dependent response. Most of this lecture today will be concerned with how one uses numerical simulation to interrogate time-dependent properties in molecular systems. Indeed, it's an incredibly useful tool for doing so but one that is easy to misuse and to go awry with. We'll spend most of this lecture discussing exactly how one should construct algorithms for studying molecular dynamics such that they faithfully reproduce some of the salient features of a collection of particles which will evolve a Boltzmann distribution. It will leverage some of the information and some of the properties we learned about concerning the distribution of phase space points as encoded by Louisville's theorem. Before we go there though, I wanna take a few minutes to discuss what we ended with last lecture because we went a little quick there. And specifically, I wanna talk about this uh, green kubo relationship because it's the manipulations we take to, to derive that are pretty general we'll use them often and so it really uh, it behooves us to to go through this a little more carefully so from last time we were considering at the end of lecture how a large particle moves around in a solvent or a tagged particle. Let's say that that particle is located here to start with. That's some position of that particle at time zero. Through the course of its evolution, it will undergo some dynamics, likely ending up over one realization of this process somewhere else, denoted R at T. And we were trying to ask a pretty simple question which is where does the particle, particle go on average? Well, we know from Newton's equation of motion that the rate of change of the position, don't need to give it a subscript, as a function of time is just given by its velocity. So integrating this, the displacement of the particle over that time t is given by an integral over its velocity. Provided we know what that velocity time series is, we can predict where the particle is later. In fact, we showed that on average, we didn't need to know anything about that time series because in an equilibrium system, the average velocity, time translational invariant, is time translational invariant. It's just the average at some time zero, which if generated from an equilibrium ensemble, an average over an equ equilibrium initial conditions, which are for the velocity, Maxwell-Boltzmann distributed, this is identically zero. So the displacement of a particle over time on average is zero. That is a reflection of a time reversal symmetry, or in this case, a spatial symmetry as well. It should be equally likely that a particle goes to the left as well as to the right. 
So a more nuanced discussion is to consider its mean squared displacement That we can define by squaring this displacement before averaging. That would give us then a whoop, two integrals from zero to t and an average over a velocity velocity correlation function. Now the time translational invariance of that time correlation function implies it could be written as a correlation with the velocity at time zero with the velocity at time t double prime less t. Noting that that autocorrelation function just depends on the time displacement between those velocities, we can introduce variables tau for that time displacement and t bar for corresponding sum for which we can solve for things like t double prime being, let's do t prime first. t prime, I can take the difference of the second equation. I could sum, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so t prime I can get from subtracting the first equation from the second. I'll get one half t bar minus tau. The second I can get from adding the two equations together. And now if I want to do this change of variables, I have multiple variables I'm doing a change of, I need to compute the Jacobian associated with this transformation. So the Jacobian is a determinant, a purely positive number, which takes a set of partial derivatives, things like d tau, d t double prime, d tau, d t prime, d t bar, d t double prime, d t bar, dt prime, which is equal to the determinant of one tau with respect to t prime is minus one, and a one and a one. That determinant of that Jacobian, the determinant of that matrix is then two. So in doing a change of variables, the mean squared displacement now written in terms of tau and t bar as a factor of two out in front. Now the limits of integration are a little more subtle. The eventual limits of integration were in terms of t prime and t double prime. We need to work them out for t bar and tau. These went from zero, zero to t, t with a quadrant of zero t and t zero. t bar being the sum is zero t, t and twice t tau is zero minus t plus t 
and zero. So if I was to shrink this, so I can get all this on the same page. In terms of tau and t bar, I have tau goes from minus t to t. T bar goes from zero to two t. Time reversal symmetry means that I only have to worry about one of these quadrants. And so I can choose that one there. So tau or t bar will run from zero to t minus tau. So this one goes from t minus tau and tau will run from zero to t. Given me then twice integral over tau, zero to t, t minus tau, and then that velocity, velocity autocorrelation function, whose limit as we go to infinity is going to be twice the diffusion constant times the dimensionality. Okay, so that change of variables, the corresponding manipulation, utilizing things like time reversal symmetry, it's very use, useful manipulation. We'll see it again and again. Okay, that being said, now let's begin our discussion, essentially an aside for this full lecture on the topic of molecular dynamics simulation. So this is a tool when used appropriately can be used to generate a Boltzmann distribution and thus sample thermal statistics, much in the way that your Monte Carlo program is already doing. However, unlike the Monte Carlo program you're using, by evolving exactly Newton or approximately Newton's equations of motion, it also like the dynamics give you access to time dependent properties of a system, allowing you to compute things like time correlation functions, which we will see encode the response to perturbations. So to understand how one should go about deriving algorithms to solve the six and coupled ordinary differential equations that are prescribed by Newton's equations of motion for an n-particle interacting system. We should note that you know, what we really care about is not so much the precise trajectories that particles will trace out on an individual particle or individual trajectory level. Rather, what we care about is the statistical properties, the ensemble properties, the expectation values over those ensembles or trajectories. And so it makes sense, I think, if we are starting from a position that we want to describe the statistical quantities of a collection of particles, to utilize the information gleaned from Louisville's theorem and the constraints and symmetries involved in that equation to deduce approximate numerical techniques from. So reminding ourselves a little bit about the discussion last lecture, from Louisville's theorem, there is an operator L that acts on a phase space such that to update a set of phase space points from some initial condition is the action of that linear operator on that point. Correspondingly, any function defined on that phase space can itself be propagated in time through that same action. Now, what exactly does this mean? You know, an exponential operator 
is defined through its Taylor series expansion. So it behooves us to deconstruct it a little bit and understand how exactly it generates time displacement. In general, for a classical molecular system, we expect that the Louisville operator has two pieces, denoted LR and LP. Well, where LR is the generator of position updates, Ri dot summed over all I, and the differential D dRi, and LP correspondingly is the generator of momentum updates or momentum displacements, sum over all P, P dot D dP. Individually, their action on a point is simple to understand. The action of a differential operator of those forms can be understood by acting an arbitrary differential operator on the space Y on a function of y, call it g of y, expanding out that exponential to zeroth order is one, that's e of zero, to first order is a d dy, the second order a squared by two, d dy squared, etc. acting on the function g of y. And now note, what that is, that is the Taylor series representation of G not at Y, but at Y plus A. So the action of this differential operator is to move the argument of that function to shift it by an amount A. Oh, but of course, only in the limit where that Taylor series is carried out to infinite precision. So in isolation, the individual operators LR and LP act similarly. If I took the differential operator for positional updates, some R dot, D, DR, multiplied it by displacement time t and acted upon that some function r of g and p, that is going to move r by an amount r dot t holding the momentum fixed. And analogously, I can generate time translations on momentum variables in an analogous way. However, the positions, of course, depend on momentum. Where positions go in time depend on how fast they're going. The rate of change is the momentum. Similarly, where position, where momentum, how momentum changes depends on the force and the force of course, depends on the positions. So these two actions, updating R at a fixed P or updating P at a fixed R, do not generate the same evolution. As a consequence, The exponential operator of the sum of those two is not equal to the product of exponentials. Those operators don't commute because they update variables who's, who depend on each other. I can't individually act on the position degrees of freedom without affecting a change in the momentum degrees of freedom. 
This is problematic because we would like to be able to update in some discrete way positions and momentum on a computer, which requires a finite discretization. So you all know the trick, however, that we can use to get around this. It's the same trick introduced in lecture eight, which is that we can take the exponential of a series of operators and factorize them in the limit that the number in front of that operator is really small, such that we can include only first order Taylor series contributions to the expansion. Such a manipulation is called a trotterization. Specifically, we can write down the, X, the full Louisville operator propagating phase space up to some time t as a limit of a factorized series of operators, non-unique, one choice of which being LP of some delta T by two times LR at some delta T and LP at some delta T by two, raised to the M in the limit that M is infinite and delta T is equal to T over n. So that trotterization introduces a, dis a natural discretization of the updates of the velocities and configurations, which we can then use algorithmically to propagate molecular dynamics on a computer where we have to have a discrete scale in time. We cannot represent a continuous variable like time to real, really infinite precision. So E to the L delta T, if delta T is sufficiently small, is then equal to a series of operations that advance momentum, position, and momentum again, in time. So the update rule implied by that factorization one that can be encoded on a computer which takes a momentum updates it by some delta t, some time step over two, by knowing what the momentum was in the past and what its rate of change was in the past, times some small time step, then updating the position through knowledge of its original position, and the rate of change of its position, which of course is just given by the momentum, which we have access to, updated a full step. And then finally, the momentum catches up to the position, advancing a full time step, given knowledge of its half step and the rate of change of that half step in the past. So that is amenable to implementation on a computer where the representations are necessarily discrete. It doesn't give us a lot of insight necessarily into what exact sorts of errors we are making in doing this discretization and what it actually means. Why choose this trotterization over another? In order to understand that, we 
could compare it to something simpler. For example, just a, C, a simple Taylor series expansion of the equations of motion themselves. For example, if we had Newton's equations, that the rate of change of the position is the velocity and the rate of change of the velocity up to a factor of m is given by a force. Taking the position first, if I wanted to update it by some time step, delta t, I could tailor expand it about that delta t, about t, to zeroth order, it's the position in the past, to first order, would need the rate of change, to second order, I need a second derivative of r evaluated at t multiplied by t squared over two. And that would be good up to third order in the time step naively. We could give these derivatives names. The rate of change of the position is just the velocity. The rate of change of the velocity is just the force up to a factor of n. Positions, velocities, and forces are things we imagine we know how to compute or know how that are being represented explicitly. Okay, how about for the velocity? Well, V updated by some time step is V in the past, how V changes in time multiplied by that time step. We wanted to go to higher order, be a second derivative of V times that time step squared. And again, that would be good up to naively third order. Giving names to these variables. Well, that's the velocity. That's the force. Oh, a second derivative of velocity. What is that? You don't know what that's called. The rate of change of the force is known as the jerk. Does that bring you back to your classical mechanics class? Let's just represent it as f dot. This looks a bit like a bummer because it seems now we need to write an equation of motion for the force. However, if we did that, f at t plus delta t is equal to f at t. It's Taylor expansion then gives you f dot at t delta t, rearranging, that's f dot of t is equal to f at t plus delta t less f at t all divided by t. That's a finite difference expression for the rate of change of the force. That then can close this set of equations if we insert that rate of change of the force into the equation of motion for the velocity giving us a velocity update rule, which takes the initial velocity, the force at time t, adds to it the force at t in the future, less the force at t, divided by two m and multiplied by delta t. That can be simplified as the force, at, as the velocity at time t, and a sum or an average over forces in the future and in the past.
So putting these two together, we have that R gets updated like so, requiring knowledge of the velocity at time t. And from the positions at time t, I can compute the force. And the velocity at time, the velocity gets updated with knowledge of its value in the past, plus the force in the past, which is given by the positions in the past, and the force in the future given, which is computable from the positions in the future, which have already been updated, like so. So one could then take these equations and iterate them to update positions first, and then velocities, positions again, velocities again, etc., propagating a trajectory through time. This equate this update rule is known as the leapfrog algorithm. If we rearrange it, by breaking this velocity into something computable before the position gets updated, and then an update of the position. And then a subsequent update of the velocity computable once those positions have been updated. Again, this is an exact rewriting, just breaking those two steps, breaking the iteration step into two pieces. We now have what is known as the velocity verlet algorithm. From Louis Verlet, one of the pioneers of molecular dynamic simulations, which is, if you look at it, identical to the update rule implied by the factorization or the trotterization of the Louisville operator. So this algorithm first derived by Louis Verlet in 1967 is the standard algorithm for evolving molecular dynamics. It's simple, it's local, it requires only information about positions and velocities, local in time, And because it is derivable from a factorization of the Louisvillian, we will see it is endowed with a number of really desirable properties, which comes from the exact solution of the Louisville equation. The sorts of properties that the exact Louisville equation has are approximately conserved in its discrete analog, this discrete update rule we've just written down. And so I wanna spend the rest of the class essentially going through that in addition to talking about some practicalities that one faces when they do molecular dynamics. Incidentally, Berlay, I think, got kind of lucky. He didn't understand this underlying Louisville structure to the equations that came about in the late 90s. 
um, through people like Mark Tuckerman, understanding these trotter splittings. Um, but he was also a very clever guy, so he probably kind of knew things that were going on under the hood. Okay, so a few words about Verlet's algorithm. So the Verlet algorithm is a second order expansion. However, what is naively a third order correction, which you would imagine comes up from the truncate where we've truncated our Taylor series is actually better than that. It's actually a fourth order error. You can see that by writing down the Verlet algorithm in the forward direction of time. Let's do this in the leapfrog version where we sum those two steps. So there is some derivative of the force that we've neglected. which naively would have then introduced a third order error. However, if we write this down in the opposite direction of time, so go back a time step, that's R of T minus V of T delta T plus R of, or F of T delta T squared minus F dot of T delta T cubed. Summing those together, gives us R of T plus delta T is R of T twice minus R of T at t minus delta t plus f of t delta t squared by m. And now this is good up to order delta t to the four because those two third order terms cancel. This is a result of the time reversal symmetry of this algorithm. Note that if I write the equation in the forward direction of time or its reverse, the form is identical. I'm only ever referencing the middle point T in both of those directions. That makes it time reversal, reversible. That means that it is an even order expansion in the positions. Indeed, one could, if you didn't need in access to the velocity information, now have a discrete update rule consisting of just the position degrees of freedom. So back in the day when memory storage was difficult, Louis Verlet actually implemented this specific algorithm and only had to store instantaneous particle positions and positions at delta t in the past. Now that's the local error. That's how much error is made at one point in time. The global error is going to depend on how many time steps I go out. So if you keep on adding in time steps, so the error for T plus N delta T, if you iterate this map, we'll go like N times N plus one over two, 
each have an order t to the fourth error. However, one doesn't care about how many time steps are evolved, rather a global time amount, call that capital T. That's what's physical, not the, the number of time steps in some arbitrary discrete update rule where, so if T is the number of time evolved for fixed time evolved, this is then an error which goes like, times order t to the fourth. So there's a buildup of error that makes things accurate only to order t squared. So the local error builds up to something that ends up being globally order t squared. Also, of course, growing with capital T, which is maybe problematic. Now, this property of time reversal symmetry noted a second ago with the dropping out of odd order in time step terms is itself really powerful. This is a notion that comes up a lot in physics. The interconnectedness of symmetries and corresponding conserved quantities. You know, most impressively and initially elucidated by Emily Norther in her Norther's theorem for every symmetry associated with the system, there is a analogously conserved quantity. Time reversal symmetry, which is encoded in the Louisville operator, as we discussed last time, implies energy conservation. So the action of the Louisville operator on the Hamiltonian yields a zero eigenvalue which implies that energy is conserved. It's a constant of motion. Now, in a discrete implementation in our discrete update rules, we are not representing the Louisville operator exactly. However, we define, you know, in a discretization following the trotterization of the Louisville operator, for any finite time step, there is an operator, a Louisvillian associated with that update rule. We've just shown that this specific choice is time reversal symmetric. And correspondingly, there exists an object, an analog, discrete analog to the Hamiltonian which is conserved. This is known in the literature as the shadow, spooky, Hamiltonian. Which is the constant of motion of the discrete update rule.
due to its time reversal symmetry. Now, there is a distance of that shadow Hamiltonian to the real Hamiltonian that goes like order delta t squared. So while this specific update rule does not exactly conserve the physical Hamiltonian of the system, it does conserve a Hamiltonian, the shadow Hamiltonian, which is close to the real Hamiltonian, close in the sense of converging as the time step squared. What's really important is that it does not depend on the total time. So because both of these operators are conserved, their errors do not build up over time. And thus, if they're close at time zero, they stay close even after an infinite number of iterations of this discrete map. So the fact that we use a time reversal symmetric algorithm ensures that at long times, we are still close in the energetic sense to the system we care about. While the individual trajectories have an error that build up with time, owing to the local error, the conserved quantity being conserved, you know, a conserved quantity insists that we don't exponentially deviate from that Hamiltonian. And of course, equilibrium statistics follow from the Hamiltonian. So to the extent that we care about statistical quantities, something that conserves the Hamiltonian is preferable to something that, that traces out exactly the trajectory we care about. Indeed, if one is interested in very high accuracy trajectories, these sorts of low order truncation schemes are not very useful. People trying to estimate orbits of you know, the space shuttle or of satellites don't use a relay algorithm. They use very high order predictor corrector algorithms, which are not time reversal symmetric and thus do not conserve energy or a discrete analog thereof. So this is one example of a conserved quantity following a symmetry. Another is momentum, which is exactly conserved under this discrete update rule discrete algorithm. Consider the total momentum at a system of this system at time t as the sum over all particles, the mass of each particle times the velocity of each particle at time t, updating by a time step delta t. This is the mass, which is invariant to time. And the update rule takes the velocity at time t and adds to it t over 2mi, the force at time t on the ith particle. That is the first term is just the momentum at t plus the mass is canceled, the t by 2 is a constant comes outside, the sum of all the forces of those particles. Newton's third says that forces are equal and opposite. So for a system absent external potentials, so 
So particles interacting amongst themselves and nothing else, a sum over all the forces is equal to zero. And this momentum updated at a time step delta t is equal to its momentum in the past, or that it is a conserved quantity. There's a more sophisticated notion relating the conservation of momentum to a symmetry. In this case, absent an external potential means that the potential energy of a configuration of particles is left invariant if I add to each particle some constant shift, call it delta R. That's analogous to renaming the origin of my space, translating all particles by the same amount, leaving their relative positions invariant. If that potential is invariant, if it has translational invariance, then this has to hold for all R, choosing R delta, for all delta R, choosing delta R small, I can Taylor expand this to first order and delta R being delta R times the sum over the gradient of the potential, which is indeed, again, to be left invariant for any finite R, re a requirement that the sum of the forces be zero. So the translational invariance is a symmetry, which corresponds to a conserved quantity, in this case, momentum conservation. So the Verlet algorithm, which preserves angular momentum, uh, preserves translational momentum because it conserves the symmetry, the translational invariance of a, uh, of a system of interacting particles, you might ask whether or not it also conserves angular momentum, or what would be the requirements to conserve angular momentum. Most of the simulations I show you are in little square boxes where I can imagine translating the center of that box to some new point. The corresponding symmetry for angular momentum is rotational symmetry. Unlike translational symmetry in a cubic box, a, you know, a, a box is not rotationally symmetric in a continuous way. It is only pointwise rotationally symmetric, rotation about 90 degree angles. So indeed, rotational moment or angular momentum is not a conserved quantity in a box with square boundaries. However, perhaps the most important feature of Verlet's algorithm is that like the Louisvillian, the action of this discrete update conserves probability. Or put in a, another way, it conserves the so-called norm of phase space. That sounds kind of crazy. What, what in tarnation does that mean, the norm of phase space? It means that if I start a system with some available 
states that it can sample, the extent of that space does not change over time. If the initial distribution is bounded to an initial region, that that region that is bounded in does not grow as I evolve the dynamics. That's important because if particles could increasingly explore more phase space as they evolve, they would never then settle into a steady state distribution. I would have to keep renormalizing the distribution as they explore more and more states. Put mathematically, this means that if I was to integrate over some initial bounding region R0 for the initial point in phase space for sets of initial phase space densities, that if I was to evolve the dynamics up to some time t, that that space is conserved. And that this is true for all times t. If it's true for all times, I can choose a infinitesimal time to see if it is satisfied for. So my phase space update rule takes me an initial point, updates it by its velocity times some time step, or defining a change of variables, x prime for x naught plus x dot times delta t, in order for the phase space norm to be conserved, I require that the integral over x, over x at delta t bounded by a region r of delta t which I've defined as primes doing a change of variables that gives me r not dx a Jacobian for that change of variables and f of x. For this to be true, that that Jacobian is identically one, so that this condition is satisfied. So what does that Jacobian look like? As we worked out at the beginning of lecture, it is the determinant of some big matrix whose elements take the updated condition of each particle all of its partial derivatives like so. Our phase space consists of positions and momentum. So there are elements of this matrix that depend on how R gets advanced delta T with respect to R at T how the corresponding velocities get updated or positions depend on those velocities. And vice versa. Inserting the Verlet algorithm, one can show that this is indeed identically one.
It's a good exercise to go through. So the Verlet algorithm is, is both time reversal symmetric and preserves probability or the norm of phase space. Both of these properties when put together defines a so-called symplectic integrator. Of which the Verlet algorithm is a canonical example. These are the necessary conditions to evolve a thermal distribution. Okay. So those, that is a lot of the formal analysis that goes into the you know, the, the choices associated with discretizing Newton's equations of motion to afford an algorithm capable of generated, generating the statistics consistent with a Boltzmann distribution. In addition to those formal concerns, there's a number of kind of practical concerns that one runs into when you're thinking about actually performing a simulation. So the Verlet algorithm provides a means to advance a system of particles. But it itself is not completely defined in that from the positions, I can update them from the velocities, but from the velocities, I need to put the positions through a function to know how to update them. Specifically, that function is a force. How do the positions of particles influence each other and generate changes to the par other particles' velocities? So an equilibrium system is one in which the sum of the forces is zero, which requires that the force is a gradient force, and thus that it is derivable from a potential. So it is a potential that then defines the specific system we're interested in. Now, the potential energy function is indeed, in general, a pretty complicated object or could be a very complicated object, depending on what level of resolution you're starting from. If I wanted to describe the interaction between two argon atoms, well, I know quantum mechanically that that interaction results from pairwise interactions between the nuclear charges, pairwise interactions between the electrons, in addition to complicated Fermi statistics associated with exchange and correlation. It is only the effect of all of those that reduces down to an interaction between those two argon atoms. And there's no reason to expect in general that those quantum mechanical details render that interaction identical to what would happen if I have three argon atoms or four argon atoms. 
Indeed, in general, one needs to solve the many body Schrodinger equation to understand what are the effective energetics of some arrangement of particles. However, it is known empirically that to a very reasonable approximation, most collections of systems are dominated by effective pairwise additive forces. That is to say that quite often a very good approximation is, say, is to say that the potential is given by a sum of pair potentials, which depend on the relative distances between particle I and particle J. So that is imagining that we've integrated out a lot of quantum mechanical details, like the motions of the electrons or the neutrons or the protons, and considered only an aggregate effective description of their interactions, ignoring non-additive contributions from many body terms. <laughs> Now, provided a pair potential, one can compute the force. The force on particle I, of course, is a vector. It is given by the gradient of a potential or in the pairwise decomposable case, given by a sum overall J not equaling to I, the derivative of the pair potential evaluated at the distance, Ri less Rj dotted into the unit vector Rij. So the magnitude is just the, the derivative of the force and the direction is the unit vector Rij hat, which is Ri less Rj divided by magnitude Ri Rj. And therefore we have everything we need to run through a Verlet algorithm. We have the force, is computable by a sum over all other particles put through a pair potential and iterated. So then a reasonable question is what is a typical pair potential look like? In a canonical one, the so-called Leonard Jones potential. Incidentally, Leonard Jones is that hyphenated name between two people. It's a single person's name, a, a man, Leonard Jones, who was born in not so such a high social standing, married a very well-to-do lady, last name Jones and adopted her last name to try to elevate his status. So a Leonard Jones potential envisions that pair interactions suitable for something like argon in which there are no permanent charges or permanent dipoles, the leading order attraction between two argon atoms comes from the induced dipole interaction associated with their electric, uh, electron clouds as a function of displacement. Those of you well-versed in perturbation theory, quantum mechanical perturbation theory will know that that is an attractive interaction that goes like one over R to the six.
you know from poly exclusion that if I try to put two argon atoms on top of each other, there will be a corresponding repulsive potential. And the Leonard Jones interactions has a characteristic energy scale, epsilon, denoting the depth of this minima, and a corresponding length scale, sigma, or where the that tells you about the crossover between the repulsive and attractive forces and the specific form is given by four epsilon sigma over R 12, sigma over R to the six. Solving for that minima gives you two to the six, one six sigma. Reasonable question is where on earth did that come from? R12, Paul exclusion, you'd expect to go like an exponential function representing the exponential overlap of the K of a wave function. In practice, that 12th is chosen just to be convenient computationally. It's fast enough that it looks kind of like an exponential and tractable to just take the pre-computed one over r to the six and square that object leading to 12. And that's why it's continued to be used. It was used initially by Leonard Jones because it actually gave reasonable fits to the viscosity of argon gas when he was doing these calculations at the turn of the last century. Now, Atoms and molecules care about energy scales of KBT, but for a that KBT itself is meaningful only to the extent that it encodes a scale of thermal energies relative to some natural energy in the system. Indeed, it would make little sense to talk about the temperature in absence any information about what this epsilon was, for example. So quite often, in a simulation, one defines a set of reduced units, which encode the natural length, time, and energy scales dictated by this pair potential. For example, lengths are naturally defined in units of sigma, the length scale of the potential. So denoting a reduced unit system R is typically defined by the real, some real unit R then in terms of sigma. Energies like the temperature are defined through epsilon. Temperature enters only into the Boltzmann factor in a statistical sense. Epsilon is in front of that pair potential and thus can pull, be pulled out through everything. And so really it is only temperature over epsilon which enters in into any expectation value. With a length and an energy, there's a natural unit for a force. In terms of sigma by epsilon. Time is a little less straightforward, but given an energy, a length, and a mass of a particle, I could write down the Verlet integrator, and this is, I think, done in the notes. And what would come out in non-dimensionalizing length is a time unit defined as tau, that is the square root of sigma squared by epsilon. And correspondingly, a velocity is easily defined as a reduced unit system with that tau and the corresponding length, sigma. From which one can write down a dimensionless relay algorithm.
So those are some practical things. Other practical things we've essentially touched on in the context of Monte Carlo, things like troubling over initial conditions, using periodic boundary conditions to simulate more extended systems, etc. I think the last thing I want to do in this lecture is just touch on what this would actually look like and show you that indeed some of the things I've said are, are accurate. For example, this relay algorithm, algorithm does conserve the total energy quite well. So let's pull that up. So here's a little soft sphere molecular dynamic simulation code that I've written employing the relay algorithm, which I'll post to B courses so that you can play with if you like. So to walk you through this, let's go find the relay algorithm. So there's relay, takes in positions and velocities, can compute forces. It's a sequential update, so it does the uh, the leapfrog version, computing the forces before and after and updating the velocity accordingly, invoking periodic boundaries in a simple way. I can demonstrate that this conserves energy fairly well through a suitable choice of small time step in those reduced units being something like 10 to the minus three. Running this for something that looks like a liquid initialized as your Monte Carlo in some square lattice arrangement. If I was to run it, we'll see collisions. Here is a time series of the different energies, the blue being the kinetic energy, the red also, uh, the, the red being the potential energy being purely repulsive is also a positive number. And the sum of those in the black is a very well conserved total energy. You see that there are little fluctuations, but those fluctuations really are small. So I can get out of this and run this for a less dense system, in which case you can more easily see the, how the collisions correspond to changes in the potential energy. So here's another square lattice, now dilute, more, met, more like a gas, as particles bounce around. Now, typically, they have no potential energy because they are far apart, farther than the cutoff where I've truncated the Leonard-Jones potential to include just the repulsive part of the potential. And as before, the sum of the kinetic and potential energies are a well-conserved total energy. Decreasing the time step even more, now you really will see no fluctuations in the total energy. So here you can see the collisions a little more clearly. You can map the collisions to spikes in the potential energy when two soft spheres get close to each other. And that total energy, the sum of the red and the blue, the kinetic and the potential, that black line is a very well conserved number. If you zoomed in close enough, you would see small fluctuations that scale like the time step squared. Okay, so you can imagine now if you have a tool like molecular dynamics, even absent any theory, you could directly measure a time correlation function in a system of interest and we will show in the upcoming lectures, use that time correlation function to predict response. All right, well, that's all I've got for today. Um, this bit of an aside on molecular dynamics with being uh, finished, we will now move on to actually tackling time dependent response. First, classically, uncovering what is known as the Onsager, uh, uncovering notions which really date back to Onsager and how systems relax in the same way that they fluctuate. This is known as the fluctuation dissipation theorem, the real fluctuation dissipation theorem, from which static case is a, is a special case of. Then we will move to the quantum mechanical version, which I like to express as integrals over imaginary time. So that will pop back up. 
And subsequent to those discussions, we will then apply that to a, case, a couple different cases, cases of the linear absorption of a quantum mechanical system in line shape theory. We will uncover the transport behavior of systems. And then work on theories to compute time correlation functions or model time correlation functions such that we have a really closed theory of response. All right, that's all I got. You all be well, and I look forward to seeing you all in the small group discussions.